Hi, welcome to Get Used To It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, and as always, I am your gracious hostess, taking you through uh, the hour of fascinating show and fascinating guests. And today is no exception. As a matter of fact, I think it's really a highlight, because every so often, we try to let you know what's going on currently with the issues of HIV and AIDS. And today, I have three extraordinary guests to talk about this and bring us all up to date. And I'd like you to meet them. Uh, Phil Wilson, who is the president and CEO of the Black AIDS Institute. Welcome, Phil. Thank you. Uh, Michael Weinstein, who is the president of the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Michael, welcome. Thank you. And Ruth Slaughter, who is the just retired from being the vice president of Prototypes. And Ruth will tell us about Prototypes as we talk. But Phil, let's start with you. Okay. Um, it's a big subject, and there's a lot going on, or maybe a lot not going on. Um, what would you say is the most important thing we need to know about sort of what's going on with AIDS and HIV issues, treatment, funding, everything today? Well, you know, it's interesting. For the last year, I've been talking about the best of times and the worst of times. And I think now it's just the worst of times. You know, um, you know we look at, you know, particularly on HIV and AIDS among gay men, we see a rising epidemic. Uh, at the same time, the Kaiser Family Foundation recently released a study that showed that people are getting less information about HIV. Uh, they think that le they, they don't think HIV is as important as it, as it used to be, and they're not as afraid about HIV as they, as, as they were. Uh, we see you know huge increases going on uh, in people of color communities, um, and we see you know a, a, a around the country you know due to the economic. Uh, downturn, you know, agencies that are closing, you know, states have budget crisis, and here in California, you know, we're basically dismantling uh, HIV prevention. Um, I guess in order not to be just the doom and gloom, you know, there is, you know, some good things that are going on. You know, the president signed the Ryan White Care Act, you know, which is an important uh, initiative. Um, we also uh, lifted the ban on HIV travel in the United States. So those are good things. But by and large, you know, I think people who are involved in HIV, you know, uh, there's this, this interesting sense of optimism that I'm totally confused about. I get that we're excited about the election of Barack Obama as president, and I certainly have, you know, uh, consumed that Kool-Aid as well. I'm very excited about it. But when I really look at the landscape, I don't know why I'm so happy, you know, because well, well, every uh, turn there's bad news. Let's look at the, I mean, you you could lecture in a class any day as far as I'm concerned because you just covered the whole waterfront in about a minute and a half. So let, l let me ask you to kind of embellish a little on uh, I each of those, starting with growing infection rates. Is that across communities? Are we talking LGBT community more than there had been? Uh, black community, other communities of color? Well, what we see across communities, you know, although you know, last year the CDC reported that the AIDS epidemic in America is 20% worse than we previously thought it was. You know, so rather than 40 annual new cases, we're looking at more like 56,000, 40,000 annual new, uh, new cases. We're looking at 56,000 uh, new AIDS cases in this country, uh, which is a significant increase. So in was that cases. just we weren't counting right or some kind of reporting well, issue? It, it, part of it is we weren't counting right and some mm -hmm. re reporting things, but just that the epidemic was just worse than we thought. Mm -hmm. um, but then when you drill down, we see kind of a leveling at that 56,000. We were never really at that 40,000 number that we were reporting. But at that 56,000, we see a leveling in most population except among gay men. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're seeing increases among gay men, and particularly among y young gay men, and, 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 and extra particularly among black, young black gay men. Mm -hmm. So we see increases in, in, in cases among those populations. Basically, the most marginalized and the most vulnerable of us uh, are at, at, at uh, increased risk of HIV. So do you see this as unusually increased so that we is there discussion about what the reasons might be? Because you were also, your second point had to do with less attention being paid or less seriousness about it or even less fear about it. Right. But h how do you attribute the increase? Well, a few things. I think that clearly there is fatigue among, you know, in, in, the, in the LGBT community around HIV. Uh, I think that the other thing that's going on is that we've gone through eight years where HIV prevention has been under assault. Now, the Kaiser Family Foundation you know, report showed that people are hearing less about HIV mm -hmm. now. 
Uh, we invested a huge amount of money in the, these absurd, you know, abstinence-only programs, mm. you know, which did nothing uh, to address issues among HIV, uh, among gay men in particular. And we totally dismantled HIV programs in our schools uh, and in, in a number of different places. So what, what we're seeing now is kind of the consequence of that neglect. Now, uh, and so I think that, that speaks to some of the increases that, that we're seeing uh, in various communities. And what about the, um, uh, th let's talk a little bit more about where the diminutions have been, uh, funding for instance. Uh, what do you see specifically either defunded or not, I can't say not sufficiently funded, that would probably be everything, but well, you specifically. Know, now over the, the last eight years, we saw a flat funding of the AIDS budget, but we've seen an increase, the domestic AIDS budget, but we've seen an increase in the number of people who are living with HIV now. Uh, and so at a time when we should have seen increases, we didn't. And so on a per capita basis, we actually saw a decrease. And that's across the board. Uh, and so when you look at prevention programs, they are much less resourced today uh, mm -hmm. you know, per capita than they were, let's say, you know, eight years ago. And sadly, because of the state of the economy, you know, the budgets that we see coming out of Washington, D.C. are no better, you know, even when we have you know, a, um, a, a Congress that is leaning to be supportive on HIV issues, and we have a president you know, who has made a commitment to a national AIDS strategy, a president who has made a commitment uh, to health care reform, a president who is speaking out on LGBT issues, all of that is not manifesting itself in additional resources on the ground. Yeah. Well, let's talk about health care reform since you brought it up because a lot of times I see a disconnect uh, in the gay community and in communities of color sometimes about, oh, you know, this health care plan that they're talking about. People don't see it really connected to their lives. They think maybe they'll be able to get insurance, but just in terms of specifics, not always clear. Do you see a connection between the discussions going on about health care reform and our concern about HIV and AIDS? Well, your question is divided into two parts. You know, I think that you're right that there is a disconnect. I think that, that people who uh, are concerned about HIV don't necessarily understand how important health care reform is. For people living with HIV, you know, health care reform is critically important. Now, now, how we get there, the devil is always in the details, mm -hmm. you know, and, and if it ends up being merely health insurance, you know, tweaking, then that's not going to benefit people uh, with AIDS as much if we talk about true health care reform. But, you know, the fact that we have, that, that if we have a system where we can get, you know, you know, large numbers of folks who are out of care into care, many of those folks are going to be those of us who are living with HIV, uh, and that is going to be a good thing. I think that the days of kind of HIV AIDS exceptionalism um, are running out, you know, uh, and in some ways, I never thought that I would say this, in, in some ways I think that that's not such a bad thing, mm -hmm. you know, I think that we've done a huge amount of work in, in dealing with stigma, though stigma is still a major, major problem. Uh, I think that it's not 1984 any longer, and, and if we can mainstream HIV care, appropriately mainstream HIV care, I think that people with HIV will be better served, and the, but the only way to do that is for us to have real health care reform. And so those of us who are interested in HIV, I think, have to be involved in the health care reform debate and discussion. And right now, I don't see us included in those conversations. And if we're not included in those conversations, you know, if health care reform actually happens, and I think there's a good chance that it might, uh, then we have to worry about whether or not our needs are going to be met. You know, so for example, you know, in certain populations, you know, if health care, if the health care reform legislation, you know, says that we're going to include HIV testing, and let's say that the regulations say that you need to be tested once a year. Well, for example, for high-risk gay men, once a year is not often enough. So we need to be having those conversations, you know, uh, around you know those kinds of programs. So you're saying uh, because you said there was a difference between health insurance and health care reform. And I think even if people in all of our communities are saying, yeah, I really want to get involved, want to be knowledgeable about what I say, how do they understand the difference? And I think what you just said may be one of the things. In other words, 
The discussion in Washington seems to be primarily around insurance. Right. Is everybody going to get it? Well, yes, they're going to get it because we're going to make them have insurance. Uh, subsidies, but what will that okay, cover? You know. Right, because then you have to have a basic required coverage that the insurance companies have to offer. Uh, and that, as you said, th those are the details that are often problematic because the minimal coverage may not be sufficient right. um, for what you're saying. So it's really a matter of making certain that prevention and testing is included, but there may also you may also not want to cap on how many times you can be tested. Are there other issues that people want to look out for in this healthcare debate? Well, of course, you know, in the HIV community, we definitely want to look out for the drug benefits. You know, you know right. and, and what the devil in the details of the drug benefit. We already experience those challenges, you know, in some of the, the existing systems but with ADAP. You right. know, uh, there are some challenges around um, the, the drug benefits, and so um, that's a very, very important detail. Um, you know, preventative medicine is an important detail. Mm -hmm. You know, what's happening with mental health uh, is an important detail. Uh, so I think that in our community. We really, I think that, that the most important thing I would say is from where I sit, we are not at the table and we need to get at the table uh, and we need to make sure that we're involved in the conversation. And the truth of the matter is it just requires us to kind of showing up because there are not really a lot of barriers. You know, they're not folks who are saying we don't want you at the table. That, you know, that may have been true at one point in time, but that is not the case today. If we show up, if we get engaged, we have the power. Uh, to shape uh, what's going to come out of this healthcare reform conversation. Michael, you've been on the ground with this issue for more years than I think I even remember, and mm -hmm. I probably remember all of them. Um, I'm interested in your take on this as well, even going back to the original question about sort of what are the most pressing issues uh, as you see them uh, at the AIDS Healthcare Foundation and your inclusion in uh, sort of in the larger discussion. Well, I think it's important to look at AIDS on a global basis. AIDS doesn't respect boundaries, it doesn't respect groups, it doesn't respect uh, counties and states and all of that. Uh, on a global basis, I think there is the possibility for the first time a glimmer of hope of global AIDS control, and that's a magnificent thing. Uh, it's been reported in the last month that there are four million people in the developing world who are getting antiretroviral therapy. Hmm. That's 10 times more than it was five years ago. And when AIDS Healthcare Foundation first started providing free care in Africa, there were only 50,000 people receiving it. So that's a magnificent achievement. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that really the biggest issue in, in HIV, as I see it, uh, whether it's in California, US, or around the world, is the fact that still uh, the majority of people in the world who are HIV positive don't know they're positive. Mm -hmm. And how do you fight a disease when you don't know who has it? Right. I mean, HIV is similar to other diseases in the sense that early diagnosis is critical. We know that the majority of new infections are coming from people who don't know they're positive, mm -hmm. which is good news because people who know they're positive are protecting their partners. And there's even better news in the sense that what we've learned is that people who are on antiretroviral therapy are rendered almost non-infectious. Mm -hmm. So actually treatment becomes a form of uh, prevention. Uh, I think what's very disturbing to me is, um, you know, I was an early and strong supporter personally, of course, uh, I represent a nonprofit of, uh, of Barack Obama for president. But uh, the things that Barack Obama voted for as a senator, he is not doing as president. Mm -hmm. And there's been a de emphasis of HIV AIDS um, on a global basis, and I believe also domestically. Uh, we ran ads. Uh, on CNN in Washington, D.C., uh, talking about how uh, Barack Obama had not mentioned the word AIDS in the first six months that he was in office. And there's discussion among high level officials in the administration about de emphasizing AIDS and putting more focus on uh, mother and uh, child health, which, of course, is, is important. Um, but I think that if the United States doesn't keep the commitment that it made, um, on AIDS, that uh, it's going to be a great discredit to us. Um, I think domestically, um, the situation is basically one where, because of treatment success, you know, people aren't dropping like flies. 
uh, that removes a lot of the urgency, both in terms of protection uh, and in terms of community mobilization around uh, these issues. I think in the gay community, um, uh, among gay men, there's a mixed bag. Uh, I think, first of all, um, that um, we've had a culture of self-destruction, which we don't really like to talk about. You know, a combination of uh, abuse of drugs like crystal meth uh, and a promotion of circuit parties and other types of things, which really uh, promote unsafe sex and unhealthy uh, lifestyles. Um, so I think uh, we need to address that. Leaders of the uh, gay male community have to be more out front and, and, and be raising the alarm. And do you think they're kind of dropping the ball on emphasis uh, in terms of the, in the gay community, in terms of emphasis on, on prevention and being aware and? Well, absolutely. I think it's, uh, you, you don't see condoms in bars. Uh -huh. uh, you don't see uh, safer sex messages uh, in places where people go to hook up on the internet. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's uh, something that people see as kind of a drag, you know. Uh, and uh, I think that younger generation of people have not seen people get sick and die of AIDS. And that is the best AIDS education that anyone has ever had, is watching somebody die of AIDS, unfortunately. So, uh, but I think that if we have leadership uh, at all levels, then I think uh, we, uh, and if we identify people in this country who are positive and don't know it and get them into care, then we can bring those rates uh, down. And I think that if you look at rich countries in Europe or poor countries in South America or Africa have done a great job on AIDS, there's one common theme, political will. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think another thing that's important is AIDS has revolutionized almost everything it's touched. And in particular, it has elevated global public health to a stature that it never had before. It's now like in the pantheon of important issues, mm -hmm. women's rights, poverty, environment, mm -hmm. democracy. Uh, and that's extremely important because we have a shrinking world with jet travel and, and migration and communication. That's not going to change. We can't put that genie back in the bottle. And so look, when I'm sitting on the tarmac, you know, in a plane in Johannesburg, I'm not thinking about terrorism. I'm thinking about germs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, if we ran air traffic control, where we run global public health, planes would be colliding in the sky every single day. So we need the equivalent of a World Trade Organization or a Kyoto Treaty. Because uh, everywhere you go in the world, we're in, we're in 21 countries, okay? Every country has different standards for testing, for, for treatment. Uh, in some countries, every state. So this is not the right way uh, to be uh, doing this. But I think one of the things that has diminished over the years that would be very helpful that existed here and other places is that the voice of people with HIV and AIDS is heard more. Uh, and I think that that was missing this year to a large degree uh, when the AIDS budget of California was eviscerated. Um, and uh, we found it very powerful when we were lobbying on the reauthorization of the global AIDS bill in Washington. We brought people from Africa, we brought people from the other countries, and we sat them down. And they got to look into the eyes of people and hear their stories. I think it's extremely uh, you know, uh, vital. But, uh, you know, the problem with AIDS overall is that it intersects all these hot button issues. I mean, if you had a science fiction novel, <laughs> you know, that talked about a disease that intersected, you know, homosexuality, race, drug use, prostitution, you know, all these things, it, it would seem too fantastic to have believed 30 years ago. Um, but, you know, I mean, in, in m many of the countries that we operate in, the three main drivers of the epidemic are all illegal. The homosexuality is illegal in many of the countries sex work and, and IV drug use. And so, you know, uh, that makes it, you know, far more difficult uh, to achieve the goals that we would like. Well, in a sense, though, isn't that an issue with stigma, too? 
um, because I, I, you know, when Phil said that the stigma is less, I think that is true in terms of people thinking if you're HIV affected or if you have AIDS, it, it's not like, oh, it was your own fault, you deserve to die. That part, I think, has, has gone. But still, there is, as you've indicated, sort of these connections, especially internationally, with, with these issues. Doesn't that make it harder for people to want to know if they have it? Well, we've been doing what we call mass testing or routine testing in Mexico City subway stations. We did for World AIDS Day last year 1.6 million tests. We did it in uh, truck stops in Africa. We did it at fish landings, and literally thousands of people lined up. People do want to know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the stigma will always exist, but in public mm -hmm. health, the whole idea of public health is urgency right. and containment. Okay, so you can't wait for attitudes to change, but you know, government inaction reinforces the stigma, and I think Phil is correct in saying also that some of the policies that we pursued early on, for very good reasons, are, are today are reinforcing some of the stigma. Uh, the age exceptionalism, in a way, is saying it's so different that we can't do it the way we do public health, and I think that's sometimes a disservice. The reality is, today, with treatment, with testing, and with prevention, we have proven techniques that can control this disease. And by control, I mean that the number of people becoming newly infected is less than the number of uh, people who are dying of disease. The pool of people who are living with the disease is going down. The reality is we have places like Brazil, they have a handle on this disease. There. Okay. We have northern European countries, they have a handle on it. Uh, up until recently, and maybe still Thailand, uh, Uganda has gone up and down, but I mean, the thing is, we know what to do. Now the question is, are we willing to do it? Mm -hmm. well, Ruth, let me ask you about, um, you spent a good part of your adult life working on issues uh, related to women, uh, families, women and children, yeah. uh, and more recently about women and HIV AIDS. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about prototypes, since it doesn't necessarily in the title tell us what it okay. does. Can I just say first, Sheila, that uh, thank you for having me here with Phil and Michael. Um, they were my first teachers because when I started HIV AIDS work and, and prevention work, um, I knew very little. And Phil took me under his wing. He became my mentor. He became my teacher. And he was so important to the work that we were doing regarding women. Prototypes is probably one of the largest women's organizations in the nation. Uh, we provide services in uh, substance abuse, domestic violence, mental health, HIV AIDS prevention, and HIV AIDS care. Uh, we have been doing it now for 25 years. Um, and it's work that is so important. And Prototypes is a model. It was innovative program to provide HIV AIDS prevention. Uh, we were the very first national organization to provide information to women regarding HIV and AIDS. Uh, we were in Boston, San Diego, Juarez, Mexico, and Los Angeles. Um, we were flown to Washington to do this national program, and we were being trained by gay, gay men and white men about how to work in communities of color. And I think the first day we realized that this wasn't going to work. So we all went back to our cities. And what we had to do was really ask the women, how can we help this, uh, stop the spread of HIV and AIDS? And the women told us. And AIDS for them was not the most important things in their lives. They were concerned about their children. They were concerned about the violence in their communities, mental health, substance abuse. So there was a whole range of issues that they also wanted information about. But because we had this uh, NIDA grant, we incorporated everything around HIV and AIDS. And the women did get the message, they did get the information, and it was evidence-based, it was changing behavior, and so many of the women did change. And so many of our programs, I do want to say, so many women across the country and probably the world are changing behavior 
and they're having safer sex and being very careful. But there's a whole generation now of young women who have no information that they don't understand what's going on and who, if he looks good and he feels good and smells good, why bother with a condom? Mm -hmm. And also the other barriers and challenges are women are afraid to maybe tell their partner to use a condom. So there's a lot of barriers stopping women for, from keeping themselves safe. So what we did is also talk a lot about STDs, we talked about unwanted pregnancies, but always tying in HIV and AIDS. This was so important to look at the whole person and not just a part of the person. Um, our Women and AIDS Care Program, uh, women living with HIV and AIDS, uh, most of them were poor women, women uh, with very little income, women may not have insurance, and their issues were housing, transportation because they had children, um, getting the medical care, because the women that we uh, worked with, they did get medical care at HA, uh, AIDS Healthcare Foundation as well as Alcanet, so they had good health care. But helping the women to get to their appointments, to being compliant, to having a support group so they would be able to even tell their families. Disclosure was one of the biggest issues that the women had, mm -hmm. telling their pa partners, telling their families. And many women were thrown out of their homes mm -hmm. once they were found, once the family found out that they were HIV positive. It took a while before we really started to grasp that there was an epidemic among women. Yes. And there was a lot of attention paid, and frankly, we were pretty much on our own in the gay community at first, mm -hmm. um, because it was like, well, that's your problem, you take care of it, yes. as we remember. Mm -hmm. But then, that started to happen, there was a lot of uh, work developed, a lot of models actually yes. developed, um, and then we started to hear, this is actually a very important issue among women, too, but I remember you telling me it was very difficult at first to kind of get that even that understanding or realization out that this was a growing population with HIV. Yes. Because we worked with such a high risk, underserved communities, HIV AIDS was not on the radar. It wasn't one of their biggest issues at the time because it wasn't like the gay community where men were dying. Mm -hmm. This was a case where you would hear about someone and then it was hidden. Mm -hmm. If someone had HIV AIDS in the African American community, that was hidden. Mm -hmm. People didn't want to talk about it, didn't want to deal with it. And we're still seeing it in our churches everywhere that it was a gay man's disease. Didn't want to deal with it at, at all. So not women were dealing with racism, homophobia, as well as sexism. Mm -hmm. So what changed? Because there did become a growing awareness about women, I think. Yeah, I, I think the, the change came when we were starting to get more and more funding, mm -hmm. and we made it a normal process of education to the community. So we found more and more acceptance, women more and more wanting to have more in information. We were seen as a resource for all of their needs, not just HIV, but HIV was very important. And one of the things that happened over the years that we were well funded for prevention and HIV care, it, we were proven that we had good services, that behavior change was uh, happening, but funding became smaller and smaller and smaller until now it's just about non-existent mm -hmm. for prevention programs. And that's very troubling uh, because we have a whole generation of young people who still don't understand HIV AIDS. Well, Michael had indicated that he um, would love to see more involvement or the maybe return to the kind of involvement we used to have of people living with HIV and AIDS yes. who themselves become uh, advocates mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. for funding, for programs, etc. Do you see in the, uh, in, you know, in the women's community, do you also see a kind of a hanging back and not being aggressive about going after that money or getting the money to in the first place yeah. in the budget? Yeah, it, it almost feels like it's a planned thing to happen. Mm -hmm. And yes, I do think the activism and the fighting has to happen again. And that's what we fought for. I mean, at one time we had lost all of our AIDS funding and we brought 40 women down to um, 
the AIDS Commission office, and they all testified until they got so tired of hearing the women that they finally approved it. But that's the type of activism, but I, it's almost like it's so passive right now. Mm -hmm. And with all the other economic crises, I see this pushed further and further in well, the background. Right. Even with the Ryan White Care Act, the reauthorization, and we're glad that they reauthorized it, but we've now lost the mandate for the HIV planning councils, and so the, the mandate for community involvement in the decision-making process is no longer there. We've lost the mandate for people living with HIV to be involved in the decision-making process. So there's an erosion mm -hmm. going on on the voices of, on the community level. Uh, and those are huge losses, and they speak to a loss in the sense of urgency. Well, let's talk about that. Um, because you've all brought up funding, I see that it's not, you know, obviously it's not the only issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But wh what, do you, what do you attribute this to? This is not great grammar, but you know, wh why are we seeing this diminution in funding? Never mind that uh, everybody's saying, oh, well, you know, it's hard times and there's less money. It seems to me that there's, as Michael has indicated, not not enough attention being paid, a little bit of uh, relaxation. Irony. I think there's an irony to the fact that we do better in certain respects during Republican leadership because we're treated by the Democrats as being like one of the tribes mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we have no place to go and, and therefore we'll, we'll kind of be satisfied with whatever they uh, give us. I mean, it's, it's, to me it's amazing that uh, aid programs are flat funded in the first year of a overwhelming Democratic majority in the Congress and a president. Uh, and you know, we've given trillions of dollars away to Wall Street uh, and to Detroit. And uh, the biggest public health threat we have in this country I is being starved. Uh, I think also that at the community level, people have such hope for uh, this new administration that uh, they feel they don't feel the same need to be active but also, I mean, we're a victim of our success, is that, uh, you know, when people were dropping like flies, when you were mm -hmm. spending your weekend going from hospital room to hospital room, and the combination of grief and, and anger and fear was so strong, of course, it was easier to get people to rally. Uh, and, you know, uh, now we have medications, one pill once a day, uh, it's all paid for, but I mean, uh, the AIDS Drug Assistance Program, which is the lifeline for people living with AIDS and HIV who, who are uh, poor, uh, that's under severe threat in California. I mean, you know, everyone was shocked and, 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 and uh, disturbed by the cuts last year, but we're facing another year where it could be as bad or worse. And, uh, you know, we had demonstrations and we had lobby days, but, you know, they were, they were weak. Uh, they weren't strong. And uh, so I think that um, if we wait until, you know, uh, it's too late, uh, it, it's not going to be good for you. But, you know, it's also, Americans have short attention spans. Um, I think even, you know, within the LGBT community, you know, there's the issue du jour. And I'm not saying they aren't important, but I'm saying that, you know, we, gotta, we have to begin to look at not just HIV, but sexual health mm -hmm. for men mm -hmm. and women as a civil rights issue. We have a right to sexual health. Okay? Uh, we don't need to be punished for exercising our, our sexuality. And that is the platform of the Christian right. You know, 91% of American parents want their children to get sex education in school. So some fraction of that 9% of cravings have more influence than the 91% of parents who want it. Mm -hmm. If they show up at a school board meeting. I mean, liberals are lazy, basically, by and large. Well, it was very difficult to get the sex education stuff through, even in California, for, uh, you know, you had to be able to allow parents to excuse people from sex education. But the interesting thing, though, Phil, is that you were saying they don't do the training in the schools anymore, right. and yet it's the law in California, at least, and I think several other states, that there must be something about mm -hmm. HIV AIDS in the schools. So are you saying it's kind of like on the books, but you don't see it happening as much? Well, I think that what's happening is that it's resource-driven, you know, mm -hmm. and so people are, meet, meet, are, are fulfilling the letter of the law, but the kind of robust 
AIDS education that was going on that was primarily driven, by the way, by the AIDS organizations. What, what, what the way the schools fulfilled that obligation is they would invite the AIDS organizations in to do services. But most AIDS organizations no longer have those types of programs, no longer have those types of speaker bureau yeah. programs. Now, those are the programs that kind of went by the wayside in the, 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 the early kind of cut. Now, now we're really cutting against the bone. We're really talking about dismantling programs. And I think for the people who are watching this show, we need to ask ourselves, do we really want to go back to the days when, when, when people actually were dying? Because that can happen, you know, because, like, like Michael said, when, when, when AIDS and drug assistance programs are in peril, and they are in peril around this country, when we're talking about real waiting lists, you know, what happens is that people actually stop seeking treatment. Now, uh, and particularly in an environment where you have you know, kind of the critical mass of folks that are in treatment, then we have to deal with things like drug resistant virus, you know, because people are not consistent and they're not adhering uh, to their, their regimens. And then we have a, a whole new and different epidemic that we've not imagined before. Mm -hmm. Now, so Mike was absolutely right that, that it will be extremely tragic if we allow ourselves to get to that place where we're facing the kind of crises that we felt in the way that we felt in, 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 in the early and mid 80s. Let me say one thing, yeah. just like, sorry, is the one group that was protected in California in the AIDS budget was the drug companies. Mm -hmm. One hundred percent. What a surprise. <laughs> but I but don't like to conflate, um, but Uzi, I know okay. you, uh, yeah, let okay. me not interrupt you. No, go ahead. I don't like to conflate necessarily who does what. I mean, my experience, I'm not in the legislature anymore, but my experience was that often we would have a more robust AIDS prevention and treatment budget, and the current governor was not as supportive. And I think it was a lot of um, what was lost this year was his, his individual line item veto if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So I think when people are, what my thing always was is if you're going to advocate, let's have a way of preparing our advocates so that they're advocating to the right people mm -hmm. about the right stuff. Because mm -hmm. when people would call and ball me out, you know, mm -hmm. for voting for a budget that actually had the funding in it right. and we hadn't cut it, it was kind of like, I'm stuck, you know, go talk to the other guy. Uh, but that's not an excuse nationally or locally. I, mm -hmm. But I think that what it means is we need to do exactly what you're talking about, which is to make certain that people, because people are wanting to volunteer, they are wanting to show up now, that they have good information. Mm -hmm. Ruth, well, you were yeah, what I was going to say, I, I feel like Phil said that HIV AIDS is mainstreamed into medical services, but it's not enough just to have medical services. Uh, the women that we see, uh, they're at very high risk because of their substance abuse, mm -hmm. because of their mental health issues, and I'm sure that's true within the gay community. We have to address those issues also, because they're not going to be compliant if they do have these other issues. So it can't be just medical care, and that's where I think that the county and probably the government is thinking, if we mainstream it, we don't have to do these other things. Mm -hmm. But I think we do. We have to look at the whole person again. So is, when you talk about AIDS exceptionalism, you really meant treated differently from other conditions or diseases. But it seems to me what Ruth is talking about is, wh you know, where is the integration of the issues of real people's lives who are living with HIV mm -hmm. and AIDS? Do you see also a separation in sort of programmatic treatment? Well, I, I just look at it that, you know, we're not talking about health care reform, we're talking about uh, sick, the sick industry. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about the health industry mm -hmm. uh, or, or, or health care. And, and that, uh, you know, we have to tell the truth to people, okay? They have to take control of their health. Mm -hmm. They are responsible mm -hmm. for uh, the way they eat, exercise, sexual health, getting checkups, and we need health care institutions that are structured to promote that. You know, best example is Kaiser. You know, I, I know people who belong to Kaiser, they harass you if you don't get 
your, your colonoscopy or yeah. your mammography. I can attest to that. Okay. Okay. Right. Now they've got <laughs> email. Now yeah. yeah. they yeah. send it to your Blackberry. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> and that's great. I'm wondering if somebody's not coming knocking at my door yeah. and said, did you have your mammogram? Mm -hmm. yeah. But that's a great thing. It is. Because, you know, we're negligent. Okay. That's how, you know, and, we, and we're in denial. But, I mean, I testified in Washington at a hearing. And I said, uh, there are three issues that have to be dealt with if we're going to deal with health care. And that is health promotion, end of life, which mm -hmm. eats up mm -hmm. tremendous amount of resources, and every system. So you're the death panel for person. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> we can blame my uh, I have all kinds of friends <laughs> who have me as a durable power of attorney <laughs> because they know that if they give me an instruction to pull the plug, I will pull it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but what a great new institution. <laughs> <we have. laughs> but the. Because I have seen so many people die horrible deaths. Mm -hmm. I saw my father' life extended way beyond reason. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other thing is, is that um, you know we have this boogaboo about rationing. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, we ration care now, but we ration well, we don't, irrationally. But the companies do. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. But the main thing is, is that um, if we're going to cover everybody and we're going to emphasize prevention then we're going to have to have a little less emphasis on some of the high-tech things. We're going to have to have uh, some things there's no harm in waiting for. And we have more MRI machines on the west side of Los Angeles than they have in Canada. Okay. Mm. That's nuts. Okay. So, but what I'm saying is what's disappointing to me in this debate is we needed some tough love, and we're not getting it. Okay. So we're really not telling people the truth, which is that uh, they are part of the team. They have to be part of the team. Mm -hmm. I think, in a way, that's also the case with HIV AIDS. I mean, we have to say to people, you know, in the gay community, I have to say to gay men, you know, you have to act responsibly. You have to, if you love yourself, you love your part, you love your community, then you have to show it by, you know, using a condom. And, and, and you have to uh, talk about these things before you're drunk or high or, or, or in, in the act, you know? And, uh, you know, I feel like, you know, sort of the unwelcome guest at the party a lot, or the scold. I think we know? used to call it the turd in the front. <laughs> 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 but, 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 but it's the truth. But you know, what's so funny about that is that that was the original message. Sure. You know, the original and message. And the community was safer sex at right. one time. That, that, and and, and it, was, it was the message that won. You know, it was the message that actually brought about the change that we wanted to have happen. Now, I, I remember, because I was at Stop Age in the very, very beginning, it was like, we have a responsibility, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and you're right, the norm was, and we did all these kinds of things that says that, quite frankly, you know, to be in our community, there was a cultural norm, you know. And, and of course, there are always outliers, but the co cultural norm was that you were going to protect yourself. And we could get back yeah, there. That's right. We ran these ads, I don't know if, if any of you have seen them, uh, in Los Angeles. We're going to run them in other parts of the country. Uh, there was a picture of Blair Underwood, and it mm -hmm. said, man up. And you free HIV test on us. And we did focus groups. And we had a straight group, and we had a gay group, mm -hmm. you know, uh, men and women. And 100% of them had seen it, and 100% of them responded that, you know, it made them think. Mm -hmm. You know, what are my responsibilities? Just that one little phrase. Mm -hmm. So I think we can get back there if we make a uh, commitment to it. But I think what Lucy yeah. was saying is it's not always, obviously we don't mean it's only up to the individual, right. because that's right. a kind of a, you know, we don't, you don't need our funding, why don't you just uh, abstain, kind right. of. You, and I know that's not what you mean. Yeah. And but it's, so, it's so different for women. Mm -hmm. You know, they can't just man up. Um, there are women who are showing a lot of responsibility and who mm -hmm. have changed, but there's also a lot of women who there's fear, there's a lot of fear about womening up. I, yes. I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> but, 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 but I think was the, the point is that the whole notion, now even in the language of man up, uh, and certainly the early messages uh, around HIV prevention were not about individual actions <laughs> now alone, they're about mm -hmm. community actions. And that's why I talked about it, about community norms. Mm -hmm. And the reason why, you know, we, we talk about women being fearful because we've not changed the community norm. Yeah. That fear dissipates when it's a mm -hmm. part of the community norm. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the change that I think we actually achieved 
you know, in the gay community. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, as I work in black communities, those are some of the changes that we're starting to see in black community as well now. Mm -hmm. Now that we're talking about, I mean, one of the things that I often say when I speak to black audiences, you know, is that if we learned nothing from Katrina, we learn, we should have learned they're not going to send the boats for us. And so should the government do more? Mm -hmm. Absolutely it should. Should industry do more? It should. But if it doesn't, mm -hmm. we still have a responsibility to survive. And so whether we're talking about women or gay men or black America in general, we all have a responsibility, you know, to survive. Yeah, and, and we should not, we cannot abdicate that responsibility. Also, I think women have borne too much of the burden of responsibility for contraception and, 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 other, and yeah. things like that. And yeah. so I think, you know, yeah. the message that... And we're the ones that needed the condoms in the bars, I guess. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, here, could you use this thing? Well, I mean, yeah. I think, I think the, the point really is, I mean, when people say to me that prevention has failed in this country... Oh, I don't okay. think... Okay, no, when did it so. start in earnest, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. I mean... Where are the condom commercials on television? Okay. Mm -hmm. We tried to run a condom commercial on Family Guy, okay, the raunchiest show on network <laughs> television. Okay, a vanilla commercial. Okay, it was refused. Okay. So uh, the, the few networks that will run them run them in the middle of the night. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, if we spend a fraction of the money promoting sexual health that we do on sugar water, then you can tell mm -hmm. me it's bad. Mm -hmm. okay. But we have national leaders uh, telling people you know, to, to man up, uh, but, uh, and I think that we do need to tell men that they have more responsibility than they have exercised. I mean, women inherently wind up holding the bag with unwanted pregnancies and, 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 mm -hmm. and, and diseases that they get infected uh, from by men, and I think. And, and that's worldwide. Yes, absolutely. But that's also part of the fear. I think it wasn't just fear of uh, disclosure, fear of being labeled, but also the individual fear when we were working together in the Violence Against Women mm -hmm. movement. Um, you know, sometimes you're just not able, really, yeah. to yeah. make the, the sex safe. Yeah. Uh, and that was an issue for the battered women's movement yes. that was very difficult because there wasn't seen to be a great deal of crossover mm -hmm. yeah. from one movement to the other. But that was very good work that Prototypes was doing mm -hmm. was really showing how those things were connected. Denial also. Mm -hmm. I don't want to even think that he is having sex with men. I don't want that to come into my household. Mm -hmm. So I will deny that. Yeah. But it's not just having sex with men. I mean, we, again, we have to look at this in the context of sexual health. We have an enormous epidemic of sexually transmitted diseases other than HIV. Yes. You know, we have yes. women getting cervical cancer mm -hmm. from it. We, we have, you know, lifetime infections mm -hmm. of herpes. I mean, 25% of all California teenagers uh, come down with an STD. I mean, uh, this is really uncivilized. I mean, other countries, industrialized countries, don't have this. Well, America, I mean, it's, I, I'm sure it's a cliche, but America has always seemed so sex-phobic to me. And certainly gay men were the first people to point this out to me. It's kind of like, why do you think they hate us? We're having mm. such a good time. Mm -hmm. um, but when I'm just trying to get the sex education bills through, mm -hmm. and the notion that parents would show up at hearings saying, I don't want my kids to know this. Yeah. Not that I, I, want, I want to be the one to tell them, but I don't want them to know that. And so if you have this whole approach, you're not going to have condom commercials, but you are going to have plenty of drug commercials about, you know, depression and I don't know what. Well, right, erectile but, but dysfunction. And it's so much hypocritical this is because turning into an X-rated show. <laughs> <It's just laughs> great. Well, while we might not want to talk about sex, you know, we are clearly having a lot of sex and we're having a lot of unprotected sex, mm -hmm. you know, because STD rates are up, you know, across the board, you know, when, you know, Michael talked about teenagers in general in California, but the national for teenage girls, 25% of teenage girls in America have an STD, and for black girls, that number is 50%. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's outrageous. When I saw that, that, that data, when it came across my desk, you know, and every black civil rights organization in America was not you know, out in the streets reading that, I mean, I was absolutely mortified by it. And so we're having lots of sex. You know, we're just not talking about it. Well, we it, think it's you know? the wages of sin. Right. That's how we treat mm -hmm. it. If you have sex, you deserve to get a disease, yeah. and uh, that's the price you pay for an unwanted uh, pregnancy and uh, you know it goes back to the issue of separation of church and state etc but I mean but the bottom line is is that um, 
we have a crisis in sexual health and we're hedonistic in our behavior and we're moralistic in our attitudes and that's a deadly combination. Mm -hmm. Well, it's always been one of the interesting things to me is when, you know, some Democrat is caught as, as in terms of a sexual kind of thing. Well, oh my God, everything is big is made out of it. But then if someone from the other party is caught like killing 14 million people because it was the wrong kind of drug, it's somehow equated like a sexual peccadillo is the same as, you know, foreclosing on 20 million people. And in a way, we allow that to happen because of the kind of sex phobia in the country and mm -hmm. the fact that we don't, we're going to make that a real sin. Yeah. When, you know, from my point of view, the real sin ha has been, why do you allow these people to stay poor and sick? Well, except they're doing both now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I recently took a vacation in Argentina, and everyone I told them I was going to Argentina, they asked if I was going to find my soulmate. <laughs> 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 I thought, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. But the question is, if we don't use the opportunity of having a democratic majority, I mean, they just stuffed. Fifty million dollars back into a bill for abstinence-only education that had been eliminated. It was, there was no yeah. evidence to support that, you know, and and it, yeah. and it was done as in the dark of night. And uh, the Democrats are not standing up for these issues because they're worried that in their constituencies that that uh, someone's going to raise this and, and you know and, and and scare people with it. So I mean, I think it's you know. I mean, it, it sounds very uh, simple, but we kind of have to grow up. We have to be more mature. And, and again, it, it applies to, to the gay community, too, is that, you know, uh, we've been dealing with a crisis in sexually transmitted diseases, including HIV. Uh, I mean, I, I went to the Gay and Lesbian Center when I was 19 years old, and, you know, half of it was a clap shot, you know, mm -hmm. which was a great service. But I mean, we know what the problem is, and we know what we can do about it, but so far, uh, we haven't had the commitment, and because we're all product of a country that doesn't have a separa separation of church and state in it, that you know, puts moralizing above practical solutions. So, in we have a few minutes left, um, and uh, really, a, I think a talk show is more actually for the viewers. I mean, we could have done this sort of with a cup of coffee around the dinner table, uh, but let's spend the rest of the time talking about what would you like seriously? What would you like to see people do? Which people and what would you like to see them do? I get elected people. You'd like to show a little more spine. Um, <laughs> there's no such thing as a Democrat, as you know. I mean, there's the people who are absolutely with us, and then the people who are scared of their constituents, and then the people who are sellouts. That's right. all my party. Right. Um, the other party, I think they have a sort of a little more truncated kind of spectrum. But what would you like to see people do? What I'd like to see. Um, happen. There are many churches, Christian churches as well as Catholic churches and in the African American and Latino communities doing really good work regarding HIV and AIDS, but it's not nearly enough. And I'd love to see more churches involved in educating their community about HIV and AIDS. Is there a particular sort of exemplary program that you've seen? The church in Oakland. Is Oakland? Allen Temple? Yes. Allen Temple. Allen so Temple. it's a community outreach yes. kind of. Uh -huh. You all come mm -hmm. whether you go to this church or not. Right. Yes. yes. Uh, you have a youth AIDS ministry. Mm -hmm. Sadly, uh, the AIDS ministry was run by a physician named Dr. Bob Scott, who just died two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But uh, they have a youth outreach program and do some not phenomenal work uh, in the middle of Oakland. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, Good. And, um, uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, there's much Metropolitan Community Church mm -hmm. that does remarkable work. Uh, there's Riverside in New York. Uh, same here in Los Angeles continues to do uh, very good work. So there are a number of churches that are, that are doing work. Uh, and I think that, you know, for those of us who are interested in HIV and AIDS, uh, we need to hold you know, those churches you know, accountable and we need to push them and we need to meet folks where they are. We're doing a lot of work with conservative churches and, and finding people are willing to start, you know, uh, if we're willing to have those conversations. You know, I think the thing that I would want people to do is to show up. Now, I think that this administration wants us to hold them accountable. And quite frankly, I think they need us because, you know, as, as, the, as the president said on election night, you know, uh, I pledge you know, to be the president for all of America. Now, and if the only part of America is showing up, you know, is the right wing, yeah. 
No, the next America that sadly uh, um, he's going to have to serve. And so I think that this administration is helped, and, 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 and they are big boys and girls. You know, and so they can take our critique. Uh, and so I think that we should hold them to the, their, their feet to the fire. And I think that actually helps them achieve the things that they said they wanted to achieve when they were running for office in the first place. How about you, Michael? What would you like to see people do? Well, first of all, to, you know, I'm getting a little long in the tooth. I, I just feel like I have a responsibility to the younger generation. It is not a necessary rite of passage to become HIV infected. If you're watching this show and you're 22 years old, you know, you do not have to become HIV positive. Uh, your generation does not have to become as infected as our generation uh, is. Secondly, I think we got to uh, keep our commitment and let people know that people do care. You know, thousands of people turn out to fundraising events and other activities, and I think they need to let uh, political figures and opinion leaders know that they really do care. If we keep our pedals to metal, we can conquer AIDS. We're not that far away from that goal, not necessarily eradicating it, but but conquering it, controlling it, and why give up now after all that we've suffered? And I think, and I hope in the long run, that we make a contribution to issues like sexual health and global public health. I want to thank you all three. Thank you. This was a great show. I'm so happy when I called the three people I wanted to have on the show. They all said yes. I knew it would be just what was needed. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, I hope that you will be involved. I hope that you will be aware. And I hope that in terms of making a difference in the world, you'll get used to it.